Hey everybody, my name is Austin Parker, and I'm thrilled to be speaking to you all today here at GoTo Chicago. So, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get into the slides and uh, talk about what we're going to talk about today. So, the name of my presentation is uh, I Can Sell You Observability, But You Can't Buy It. So, what does that mean? Well, First off, let me tell you why you should care about what I have to say on this topic, because uh, I think that's probably an interesting way to start, or at least a traditional way to start. So my name is Austin Parker. I'm a principal developer advocate for a company called Lightstep. We are an observability platform. You can find me on the internet at these locations. Uh, you can also you should also know I wrote a book, uh, helped write a book about distributed tracing, which is relevant to what we're going to talk about here today. So to get started, let's talk about what observability is, right? And I think there's several different definitions. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of uh, piece this puzzle together. But what I like to sort of summarize it is by saying, you know, observability is about a practice and a, a set of processes that help you understand your system. And now that can be your system in production, that can be your very large system, it can be your very small system. It can be systems of all shapes and sizes. You know, this is not just a thing that you need if you have some big, you know, world spanning, you know, technology, right? This is very useful for everybody that's building software. One of the questions I often get is, you know, can you tell me the difference between monitoring and observability? Because I think that, you know, we, we think about monitoring <clears throat> quite frequently. And I'm just going to summarize this, right? Monitoring is about figuring out what's normal at some point and then kind of trying to hold normal in your mind at all times. Try to constantly make sure your application never gets out of that normal state. Observability is really interested in helping you answer the questions that aren't normal. The questions, you know, the unknown unknowns as we like to call them. But this is things like, you know, for user X uh, in condition with condition Y at time Z, you know why is performance worse for them, right? These are questions that monitoring makes it can struggle with because monitoring is really interested in looking at, hey, how much memory, you know, to be productive, but how much memory am I using right now? Is that more or less than I was using yesterday, right? What's the, you know, how long does it take for this service to respond to some health check. Those are all interesting factoids, but I don't think they are going to help you actually understand your system overall. Observability is made up of two parts. It's not just um, tools to help you understand, you know, to sort of sift through reams of telemetry data. It's also, and I think it's most importantly, about culture. And that culture is kind of the f focus I want to talk about next. And it's really the focus of a lot of this talk. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about tools later, don't worry. But the culture, I feel like, is what stops most people before they get started in terms of an observability practice. So with that in mind, I want to tell you a story about the things you can buy uh, for observability. Now, before I got into this job, I, I worked in <clears throat> for a company that had a big uh, .NET platform as a service, and we were having this problem. And to summarize, our problem was that we had a bunch of different data about our system, but we didn't understand how it all fit together. We didn't understand how to connect it to what was actually happening. We had these three pillars. We had metrics. You know, we could see how much memory am I using, how much CPU am I using, what's the disk space situation like. We had logs that could be aggregated and indexed, and then we could even search them across, you know, a distributed system. Admittedly, that log storage was a SQL database, but you go to war with the tools you have, not the ones you wish you had. We even had a distributed tracing of a sort, right? We had a correlation ID that would propagate across uh, requests from computer to computer, from service to service, and so by using some special in-house tools you could kind of piece this all together and see the life of a request. 
sounds great, right? And I think if you go look at many um, places to buy this sort of stuff, this is what they'll give you. They'll say, hey, yeah, we got three, we got it, we got it, we got three pillars, we got metrics, we got logs, we got traces. Uh, just click here, sign up for free. And this is what I did because I said I, I had been told, you know, hey, we this isn't working out great. We can't, you know, we we keep having problems. You know, in the middle of the night, someone gets woken up, we waste a 16, 20 hour test cycle, we can't ship fast enough. So go out and, and find a product that does this. And so I did. I found a product and I bought when we bought it, we signed the contract, we started out on a free trial, and we moved into um, production very quickly. And I was so impressed with all the built in dashboards and how easy it was to get started. And so I go, install it everywhere, configure it. Take it to my developers and I get this. Now, why is that the case? Well, I think a lot of people have probably been in the situation where you wind up, you know, solving the problem that you thought you had, but not really the one that you actually had. So why did I get it in this case? Well, fundamentally the problem wasn't that we didn't have tools to understand what was going on. Like I said a few minutes ago, we had tools. We could see metrics, we could see logs, we could search those logs, we could see a trace of a sort. What we didn't have was a culture that allowed us to really understand performance and talk about performance and measure what mattered. Because all these different data sources were siloed off, it was impossible to kind of get any kind of real idea about what was happening you know, why one thing changing caused another thing to break. It was a very frustrating experience, but it did sort of lead me to this realization that there has to be some better way to handle this, right? You know, it's the kind of the endless back and forth, the endless recrimination and people yelling at each other that, you know, service owner A says, hey, you know, it's not my service. I, I've got five nines of uptime. Service owner B saying, well, it's not my problem. I got six nines of uptime. And ni the actual problem not being about uptime, right? You can have great uptime, but you can have a terrible culture. You can have people getting very angry with each other and just not really wanting to you know, cooperate. So you need more than just tools. Now you can... You can buy them. You can get them for free. And there are uh, a lot of great, you know, open source tools that help you collect telemetry data, understand it, interpret it, and piece it together. And there's a lot of companies and a lot of organizations that have kind of done that. But all those tools won't mean a lick if you don't have, you know, a good culture around this. So let me try to sell you on culture. Now, I'm going to do this through a couple stories, um, two really. The first is a story from Google, and it's a story about uh, how their distributed tracing tool was implemented and, and sort of built into all of their backend systems, because they had a tool called Dapper, and I believe they still do actually, and Dapper was everywhere, um, but they, were fa they found that it wasn't getting a ton of usage. Why was that? Well, the assumption was, well, we must have, uh, you know, there must be some feature we're missing. We, we need more cool analytical stuff. So went and built more analytical features and all sorts of cool jazz. But still, adoption wasn't really taking off. One day, someone had the idea, well, let's, let's link to this from this other system that people used a lot. And lo and behold, suddenly a lot of people start using this new tool, right? They start using, this, they see this link appear, something called Dapper, and it's like, huh, what's that? They click on that. Some percentage of those people found it very useful. So they start coming back, right? The cultural lesson here is trying to bring in tools to sort of inspire dramatic change isn't gonna work very well if you're telling people they have to change how they're doing their job, right? A good tool should complement um, an existing process or a process that you want to build rather than be kind of its own isolated experience to the side that someone has to go out of their way to use. You want to integrate things into existing workflows like they did at Google. Story two. This is a another fun one and this is one is about aeronautics. So if you are a pilot or you play flight sims, you probably recognize both of these things. Um, 
One's a dial and one is a tape, and they both measure the same thing, which is airspeed. So before I go any further, I want to shout out to uh, Sidney Decker, who wrote a wonderful book. It's called The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. It is one of the most important books I've ever read, and if you are big into systems thinking um, and you lead technical teams, I highly recommend it. It'll change your life if it hasn't already. So we found, or Decker finds in kind of interviews that as technology, you know, technology advances and now instead of having to just have these little, you know, dials uh, with a needle pointing to the current speed, they can go build cool LCD screens and they can put sort of a tape where the current airspeed is always in the center. And it might seem like that this is, you know, obviously better, right? I, I don't have to, if I'm trying to read the current speed of something, it's the difference between an analog and a digital watch. On the dial, I have to ascertain where the needle is and then figure out what's between, you know, what exactly what is between and, and turn that into a number, right? Like right now it's, you know, 130 knots. Whereas on the tape, I just look at the center, it's 125, it's right there. So you would think that'd be the end of the story and everyone's using the tapes, right? Well, it turns out that a lot of pilots prefer the dials. And I think the rationale here is very interesting. It's that people weren't actually reading the dial. What they were doing is they were looking at the position of the needle relative to other parts of the dial and they were creating what Decker calls a speed space, right? So they basically had a, a fixed position that they could look at and say, not only you know, is the needle in this position relative to other conditions, but also which direction is the needle going? Is it, you know, not moving at all? Is it moving up or down, you know, back or forth, slower or faster? And that's stuff that's really hard to get off of a tape. Because if you just look at the middle and you say like, well, it's 125, but what, you know, what was it before then, right? Is it going up or down? That's something that actually takes more sort of cycles in your brain to process. So not only do people prefer the dial, they actually found that the dial was a bit safer. How does this relate to software? Well, again, if you're bringing in new tools and you're bringing in things, new technologies, you need to, you know, be aware of how people are kind of doing stuff today. Uh, the ways that we do things are not simply arbitrary and capricious. I mean, sometimes they are, but a lot of times that arbitrary capriciousness has a purpose. So don't just rip everything out and put the flashing new stuff there. Make sure that you're doing it with an understanding of your existing culture. Both of these things can't really help in a lot of cases. Um, because, well, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't, right? If this is your kind of off office life, you know, you have a giant panda running around breaking computers. Maybe that giant panda is a manager. Um, but if this is what you have to deal with, then tools are going to be more of a challenge. But I will say, you know, it's not about fixing. It would be nice if we didn't have to deal with difficult people. But oftentimes what I have found is that these cultural challenges can be ameliorated in some cases by having good observability practices. Because if you are able to have a good observability practice. If you're able to sort of have a level set of, hey, this is what performance is. This is how it matters to people. Um, this is how we can talk about it as team to team, person to person. Then the giant pandas are a little less giant. They're a bit more docile. So with that in mind, you know, if we have this idea of culture of being able to, you know, have a rational, calm, collective conversation about performance, something that, you know, isn't just bringing in bulldozing new to new tools into our existing processes or replacing our existing processes, but something that enhances them or complements them. How do you evaluate those tools? Well, I want to kind of leave you with a little bit of a rubric here. So if observability is about principles and practices around understanding your system, then the goal of it is to provide those is to do that through these activities, right? And these activities are to measure the impact of performance on your users and then explain variations in the, the measurements you've taken. That leads to sort of two goals, which are improving baseline performance and then addressing regressions in performance. Or we can shorten that to saying you want to improve an SLO, 
a surface level objective, or you want to resolve a regression in an SLO. Now, why is it important to measure the impact based on users? Well, if you're doing performance work or you're getting paged, um, you better make sure that that connects to a user in some way. If you're getting woken up at 3 a.m. because a disk that doesn't matter is running out of space, then you need to reconsider your alerting. Conversely, if you're spending a week you know, unrolling loops and trying to tighten up some section of code, if that section of code isn't on the critical path and isn't actually contributing latency to a request, you know, what are you doing with yourself, right? Now, the tools will help you with the second part of this, the explaining the variations of those measurements. But the first one, I would say, having that user-focused um, kind of mindset, that's really a function of your culture. So when you have a tool, how do you evaluate it? There's four characteristics you can use. Uh, the statistical fidelity, so to oversimplify, if I have a large amount of requests, I need to maintain enough information to capture sort of the shape of those or that behavior, you know, by grouping them into a histogram or something. So I can't like get rid of too much stuff, right? I need to be able to have these aggregate measurements. Cardinality limitations. So this is, you know, if we want to go back to, I want to explain variations of performance, I need to be able to do that across, I need to be able to take my data and compare it across different dimensions. So I need to be able to ingest and analyze data across potentially infinite dimensions. You know, let's think about volume limitations. So pretty straightforward. How many telemetry events can I capture every minute? And then how much detail can I capture with those events, right? Finally, what's my horizon of data? So, you know, what's my time limitation? By which I mean, not every service I have, not every application I have is going to need to capture the same amount of data or retain that data at the same rate as every other one. Some things I might want to keep a year's worth of data. Some I might want to keep an hour's worth of data. It really is going to depend on your system. So you need to take these four things into account when you're you know, evaluating a tool. And those tools should help you narrow the search space of your explanations, right? You want things that can provide context because most problems aren't caused by one failure. You need something that will help you prioritize your work by the impact to your end users, right? Rather than by, you know, whatever arbitrary or capricious thing you might have already done. Finally, you need something that will help you automate correlation. And when I say automate, cor automate correlation, what I mean is a distributed system is going to be significantly larger and have a lot more different moving parts, right? If I have some big Kubernetes application with thousands and tens of thousands of nodes, I need to be able to figure out like what's important and what's not important. And I don't really need to be, I don't want to dig through that and I don't want to find that needle in that haystack by myself, right? I want my tools to do it for me. Uh, thought experiment. If I'm rolling out a new release of something, some other team sees, you know, error rate spike. Well, it would be really good if they could know that that error rate spike is correlated with new versions of this application or this service versus, you know, correlating it with the hosts or the data center they're in. Because one of those would let you, give you the ability to quickly say like, aha, we're having a, you know, we need to stop this rollout, we need to revert. The other means potentially hours of, you know, painstaking wild goose chases through a bunch of access logs that you don't really need to be looking at. Meanwhile, error rate continues to climb. You now are actually affecting a significant portion of your end users. It's a bad time. At the end of the day, tooling and culture go hand in hand. Um, you need good tools in order to start to shape and improve your culture, I believe. And you need a culture that's willing to change and accept sort of new ways of doing things in order to, you know, make these sort of big changes in your, the way you think about performance, the way you understand performance. Segregating all of the you know, performance people off into one team, making it so it's you know only their problem, um, having kind of animosity about performance and everyone having their own little vanity metrics, you know these are things that tooling can help resolve. But tooling by itself is not going to resolve those unless you have the will to change, unless you have the ability to put people at the center of your observability story. So, with that in mind. Thank you so much for, you know, kind of showing up and listening to this today. 
Again, if you would like to find me on the internet uh, at Austin L. Parker. And yeah, take care out there. Stay safe and wash your hands. Bye.